So yesterday we saw Amazon platform itself as a whole and how the global infrastructure part of Amazon fits into the cloud ecosystem. Uh, we saw what is Amazon regions and inside the regions we have multiple availability zones and within those availability zones there will be multiple data centers also. We, we also saw that availability zones are designed as a high availability uh, mechanisms. So if your application needs high available solution, you need to deploy them into multiple availability zones. There is also something called edge locations. They are nothing but a content distribution networks. Uh, we will see them when you are looking at the application platform services or cloud front service itself. For now, think of edge locations are places from where you can distribute content to multiple parties with the least amount of work from your end. Uh, we will see more in detail uh, when we are looking at the application services. Mm -hmm. uh, so today's class or today's session is going to focus on the foundation services, especially the compute, storage, database and networking layer. That is the second tier that we see on this uh, matrix diagram. We are going to focus uh, today entirely on this segment of it. And we will start off with the compute services which one of our esteemed colleague seems to already have some familiarity by starting some instances. So let's go ahead and see what is compute, what is EC2, what is uh, other services available there. So in compute, uh, there are three main services, I would say. Uh, there are many other things are there, but uh, we, uh, we will focus our uh, we will have our focus on these three services that is EC2, auto scaling, and Lambda. So let us go ahead and see what EC2 means. EC2 is the Elastic Compute Cloud. That is the short form of uh, that is the EC2 is the abbreviation of Elastic Compute Cloud. It is nothing but your virtual servers in the cloud. In your on-premise world or in your regular day jobs, you might uh, be dealing with creating LDOMs in Solaris or LPARs in uh, AX world. Or in Windows, you might have uh, used a Hyper-V to create your uh, Windows uh, virtual machines. Similarly, in the cloud, the virtualization layer is managed by Amazon and you are allowed to create VMs. And this service uh, that allows you to create the VMs is called Elastic Compute Cloud. And this service is completely flexible meaning that uh, once you register for an account and your account is active you can uh, start any size of that instance uh, and uh, say for example you after your account is open there are certain limitations but you can go from something like a half a gb uh, ram machine to all the way to about uh, 16 cores or 64 cores and uh, once you have built some credibility amazon will allow you to launch the very big uh, server also or you can pay for them or give them a business certification and launch your servers to the biggest size. It is not just launching the instances in the biggest size, you can resize the instances dynamically. What I mean by that is you don't have to build another machine of a higher capacity uh, just to increase the CPU or memory. All you have to do is uh, the instance will be a software configuration, just stop it and then uh, click on the next instance type. Say I want 4 GB now instead of uh, 2 GB and then restart your machine, you will get your higher capacity. So that is what it means by resizable compute capacity. It is almost instantaneous. It doesn't take too much time uh, to attach all these additional resources. It is only the reboot time, which is uh, a start and stop. I mean, stop and start, which is typically about one or two minutes, not more than that. So in a non-premise world, you might uh, think of it, it takes a huge amount of time just to commission or order a new server, commission it, install it, configure it, and migrate the data. Uh, all those things are avoided in here in the um, AWS world to when you're trying to increase the CPU or memory of a system. Of course, you can talk about the DL or all those dynamic location properties, but uh, that all those things will be limited to that particular uh, physical server. If you want to have CPU located in uh, your uh, a different data center, unless your physical server has that capacity, you cannot add that. And there's a limitation of that also. Uh, so in the cloud world, there is no limitation. Literally speaking, uh, you can keep on adding resources uh, and Amazon will provide the unlimited elasticity on the back end of it. Uh, 
and you have complete control over what is happening on your cloud that means that you can decide when you want the biggest instance when you want the smallest instance uh, there is no limitation on saying that you started the biggest instance you need to run it for 10 days there is no limitation or no uh, forceful behavior here and it also uh, the time i spoke about this already the time taken to boot a new server is usually in minutes uh, once you start an instance, uh, you find that within two or three minutes, it's this provision to you and you can connect to it either through SSH or RDP in Windows. And uh, this number is uh, growing. Uh, it is very difficult for me to keep updating the slides also. There are more than 30 plus different instance types. Uh, what I mean by that is when we go deeper into the EC2 classes, when we start doing the demos, I will show you what it means. For now, understand it as saying, uh, the smallest CPU uh, machine to the biggest CPU machine is one category, whereas the smallest RAM to another biggest uh, RAM is another group of category. Amazon classifies them as uh, RAM optimized servers, uh, CPU optimized servers, network optimized servers, graphical processing servers. So these are the broad classification of uh, servers that is available in Amazon. So you have multiple combinations of this. So depending upon your workload, say for example, you want a database uh, with this uh, needs to be running on EC2, that means you need to have a lot of read and write operations. So you choose a machine which is having a lot of uh, IO capabilities. Or if you're doing video processing, that is a lot of CPU cycles. So you can buy a machine which is having CPU optimized uh, instances. So depending upon your use case, you will choose your instance types and there are variety of instances to cater, uh, to, cater to multiple business needs. And you, the size and scale is completely, uh, it is to your flexibility, uh, you can choose what you want to run. And finally, you will pay only for what you are using here. So EC2 uh, I can be said as the backbone of Amazon. Almost all the services run on top of EC2 instances. There are multiple levels of virtualization, your containers, your serverless architecture, your notification systems, everything indirectly runs on your EC2. So this is the platform or bed on which every other service that you consume in Amazon runs. Even if you take about, uh, talk about um, EMR cluster, which is nothing but a big data cluster, which, which is nothing but a collection of EC2 instances. If you're talking about a container-based deployments, all those containers will indirectly be deployed on your EC2 instances. So uh, EC2 is the core uh, function of uh, Amazon Cloud Service and we will see more in detail when we uh, do hands-on classes. So auto scaling is another complementary service which is also part of EC2. What it means is, uh, remember when you were talking about the demo sessions, I spoke you, uh, I spoke about business rules which will allow you to scale your infrastructure. So that feature is nothing but is called as auto scaling in Amazon. Uh, when I say business rules, uh, you can say something like the number of transactions in my website is uh, more than ten, then add one more instance. Or if the payment uh, through the payment gateway is uh, more than uh, this number of payments per second, then add more instances. And during after the festival season is over and you find that there is not many transactions, then you say that uh, remove uh, X instance. This is at a business rules. You can come down to operational rules saying if my CPU is 80 percentage and above for continuously 15 minutes, add one instance. Uh, if my CPU is on average 15 percentage for 10 minutes, then reduce one instance. So by configuring these rules, the auto scaling servers will add and remove servers. Uh, that is the main functionality of this. This way, you don't have to predict what capacity you need. You don't have to maintain the servers in addition already or install it and provision it and wait for the demand to come into place. Automatically, your instances will be added and they will be removed when your demand goes down as well. And once again, for using the service, there are no additional charges. Auto scaling works uh, freely with uh, EC2 and there is no separate charges. Only the underlying EC2 instances will be charged for you. If it is running for one hour, you will be paying for one hour. If you're running for 10 minutes, you'll be paying only for 10 minutes. And it integrates with another service called Elastic Load Balancer, uh, which is uh, typically the load balancing service that Amazon provides. We will see what it means in the networking group of uh, services that we talk about. Uh, let us focus on compute and see the final one, Lambda. 
this is a completely a serverless uh, architecture that Amazon provides. Uh, typically what happens is uh, in any server that you take, there is an application code that is uh, to be run uh, for doing some processing. It might be adding two numbers. It might be uh, resizing an image. It might be converting a video from one format to another format, or it, it might be converting a CSV file into a graph or a Excel or something like that. In other words, it is doing some data processing. The application code is doing that. So instead of running a full server and running the code uh, for only when the demand comes, why not have a service which will get triggered whenever you need it and it will shut down automatically when the order completion is completed. So that is what Lambda provides you. It is an, it, it, the code is run in response to events. The event can be something like somebody uploads an image that image will be picked up, resized, and done some analytics. And once that all that activity is completed, your Lambda will sleep. And you will be paying only for the time when the Lambda service is running, that is when the processing happens. And Lambda is another fantastic feature is, uh, say for example, today only 10 people are uploading images to your service. And tomorrow, because it is famous, 1,000 people are uploading images. And day after tomorrow, 10,000 people are uploading. So you need to scale your Lambda, right, from 10 to 1,000 to 10,000. Lambda will do that automatically for you. There is no need for you to configure auto-scaling or anything. When more and more requests comes, automatically the Lambda service will trigger multiple uh, services on the background and it will run for you. So you don't have to do anything for scaling in Lambda. So that is one of the beauty of uh, Lambda itself. Uh, you just write your code and worry about uh, getting your code successfully completed and handle any errors that the code might self, itself throw. So all the scaling part of it, the cost part of it, the infrastructure part of it, everything is managed by Amazon. You don't have to say, uh, I want a CPU optimized instance. I want a memory optimized instance. I want uh, IO optimized instance. You just tell Amazon, I need 50 uh, MB of RAM, one CPU, and Amazon will provision that as many as you need and whenever you need it because Lambda is not running continuously. It just runs for a very short period of time so that resources is not allocated for you and you are not billed for that resources also. Only when the time it runs, it you are going to be billed for that. So this architecture is slowly getting famous. Uh, most of you are from the admin background so you might not be uh, writing Lambda code yourself, but uh, you be aware that uh, the automation work, a lot of uh, backup monitoring and the security are happening in Lambda world. Somebody will be writing the script, but you will be uh, needed to configure it or check at the logs or uh, take a backup uh, which is managed by Lambda itself. So a lot of things are happening in Lambda. Slowly people are moving from uh, server-based architectures to serverless architecture that is uh, based on Lambda. Uh, so as on today, I would say EC2 takes about 70 to 80 percentage of the workload and 20 to 30 percentage of activity happens in Lambda. So interviews are asking awareness about Lambda, but they don't expect you to write the code itself. You just need to tell them what Lambda is, what it can do, how you can use it to save cost or automate it. Uh, and while we are doing the classes, I will show you one hands-on demo with Lambda. Uh, the code is also written, pre-written. You can just copy paste it and you should be able to run it. Uh, if anybody is familiar with the uh, code, you can go ahead and read it. If not, just run it, blindly copy paste it and get yourself familiar with uh, how to configure a Lambda. So that is what is required from you in terms of Lambda. So we saw what are the uh, most important services in a foundation that is EC2, auto scaling and Lambda. Let us go ahead and see what are the different services offered by Amazon in a storage group of services. Uh, this is one of the most uh, popular services in Amazon, uh, the storage, because it is most cheapest as well. So you, as you can see on your screen, there are multiple options available uh, for so when we talk about uh, storage and content delivery. So let's just go ahead and see each one of them in detail. The simple storage service is nothing but an object storage. When I say object storage, I, um, what I mean is 
you can store any type of files whether it is csv png jpg movies uh, vmdk mkcsv or uh, anything that you can think of a text file or a document file html anything uh, it is just for storing or archiving any amount of data the amount of data that you can store in s3 is not particularly limited because the buckets as we call it there is no directory structure here there is no hierarchy here so it is called as buckets and data is stored as in buckets in s3 and the size of a bucket there is no upper limit you can keep on adding more and more data and amazon will automatically scale your bucket but there is a limit on per size of particular object say you have a movie file the biggest file that you can store is about six terabytes that is a single biggest object that you can store is about six terabytes i think i probably have to check the limit but it is in terabytes that much i am certain so by uh, having said that limit there is no limit on how many objects of that size you can store it so if you have thousands of images of it in terabytes of sizes go ahead and upload them amazon will automatically scale uh, the background the service for you and another interesting thing is by default it allows you to support encryption also so all you have to do is check a box uh, in the amazon s3 service and the data that you are storing in amazon will be encrypted uh, nobody other than you will be able to retrieve the data without your account keys so amazon will also be not knowing what is stored in your s3 bucket it is not your google drive where google can see what is inside that google drive documents and recommend you with advertisements s3 buckets are completely secure uh, you can use encryption uh, and the transport layer encryption is also possible when you're uploading it you can encrypt it on your side and then upload it also and it is highly scalable that means that uh, Amazon and S3 is one of the highly available services 11 nines of availability is given to you by Amazon uh, so uh, we spoke about security also it supports both the client side and server side inscriptions it allows you to have access logs it allows you to have role based access also you can give very fine grained permissions for example you have multiple buckets in your account and you want to give access to only one bucket uh, in your account to some third parties or public access that is also possible once again the storage is uh, charged based on how much amount of data you store there and how often you retrieve so there are two to three type of costs here one is the amount of data that you store uh, you will be fixed charges like per gb will be 0.015 cent depending upon the region that is one charge and the next charge is how much uh, data you are retrieving that is bandwidth charges upload and uh, read and write in other words how much data you are reading and how much data you are writing so there will be bandwidth charges also so come back a combination of, of these three charges will be applicable for your account when you are talking about s3 having said these three charges if you calculate it for 10 gb 20 gb 100 gb uh, it will hardly be four or five dollars not more than that per month for an enterprise or a very big company uh, 100 gb of data is a uh, huge and for them paying 20 20 dollars for storage is very very cheap given that uh, the availability requirements and the resilience requirements are taken care by amazon you don't have to duplicate the data uh, fortunately we don't have any storage admins here uh, most of the storage management will be concerned about uh, data duplication, replication, uh, deduping and all those capabilities. Since you have 11 nines of availability, you don't have to copy the data 10 times in 10 different locations. Amazon will do that for you. You don't have to worry about it and your cost also comes down significantly because you're not having multiple copies. So S3, uh, if I say EC2 is the backbone, uh, S3 is a supporting infrastructure of uh, uh, EC2. So the combination of these two services creates a very good platform for Amazon to run a lot of things. So we spoke about uh, object storage. Now we are going to speak about the block level storage. Uh, Amazon Elastic Block Store is your uh, block level storage that is provided to you by Amazon. Here you can think of it for understanding purposes as similar to your uh, uh, external disks or C disks or SAN disks that you might be used in your on-premise data centers. But it is a lot more than that because you can have a snapshot capabilities, you can have encryption capabilities, uh, you can have a combination of SSD disks, magnetic disks and uh, 
so as on today this is t and magnetic only uh, uh, tapes were also available uh, so you can have a combination of all these three types of uh, disc types in your ebs volumes so you can have uh, provision iops what that means is uh, uh, if you want a very high performance disk, uh, in use of having a RAID and having your create your uh, input output, output optimized, you can order a disk which is already pre optimized for certain amount of IOPS and then use it in your applications. So, in case you provision it for let us say 200 IOPS and your application team comes back and says, No, 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 my application needs 400 IOPS, all you go ahead and do in the console is just drop down to 400 IOPS and say apply and the optimization takes about uh, X amount of time and you start using it. There is no data copying uh, and uh, unmounting the disk, copying the data again and remounting the disk. All those nonsense is avoided here completely. It's all dynamic. The IOPS gets increased uh, in almost in real time. Whenever the size of the disk is small, it is real time. But if you are trying to optimize a one terabyte disk or a four terabytes of disk, which is the maximum you can allocate. Uh, per disk size, yeah, optimization takes some more time. So here also the limit of disks is unlimited. What I mean by that is you can have any number of disks attached to the server and uh, the maximum size of, uh, size of a single disk is close to 4 terabytes in size. Uh, some of these numbers or most of the numbers in Amazon you don't have to memorize, you don't have to remember. Uh, it is, but it is good to know when you are talking to a client or an interviewer uh, to tell them that there are limitations and some of those limitations can be uh, increased by talking to Amazon. Some of those limitations cannot be increased as on today. Uh, so depending upon your rapport with Amazon, you can increase it. So that is what the block storage option Amazon gives. Uh, moving forward, we have CloudFront. This is the edge location that we I spoke about. Amazon has, uh, once again, this figure is wrong. Amazon has recently publicly announced that they have 90 edge locations, meaning they have a lot of uh, data centers for content distribution all across the globe. And what you do is you tell Amazon saying, this bucket is having all my content copy it to all the edge locations in the world so that my users in Australia, US and Europe will have the lowest latency and highest transfer speeds possible. And if you think that uh, your uh, users are going to be only in the US region, you can uh, say to Amazon saying copy it only to the US region and not to the other edge locations. So that is also possible. You are allowed to have customizations where you want to distribute your content and how long you want to distribute it. Say, for example, you want to expire your content after 10 days. Um, it is, uh, typically happens in uh, shopping websites. Uh, you will have a festival season and you will have a particular URL with a coupon code attached to the URL and people click on that. Uh, they will be taken to a particular website. Uh, after two or three days, that coupon code will not be valid. You need to be redirected to a, another page. So in those cases, uh, you can expire your content and configure uh, complex rules at the application level also using CloudFront. It's a very uh, fantastic feature. A lot of content distribution uh, networks use that. A lot of static websites use that. Uh, if you guys uh, want to think of an example, Amazon.com, uh, the, uh, the e-commerce portal itself, uh, if you think of it, except for the payment gateway, everything all that you see, the payment gateway and the recommendation part, Everything else is a static content. Uh, so all the content that you see on your page comes from your CloudFront itself. Only your recommendation at the bottom of your screen and the payment that happens in real time, everything else is uh, static and that is all loaded from CloudFront. And Amazon uses AWS on the background for that. So if ever you are faced with a static client, I mean static website for your client, you can recommend CloudFront as a service for them to reduce the latency and improve the availability uh, for them. Fantastic service, it supports SSL uh, for um, security and it also allows a geographical restriction, it allows for private content. Say if you're a corporate and you want to allow access only to your employees from certain URL, that is your corporate, uh, anybody logged into your corporate VPN should be able to access your content, that is also possible. So only they will be able to access it. So that is uh, what CloudFront offers you. 
and uh, edge locations means the places where the servers are i will show you the architecture diagram for edge when we are talking about that so moving forward glacier it's nothing but an archival storage in the cloud there are sometimes complaints reasons for uh, medical ins uh, and insurance companies and financial companies saying uh, the data has to be stored for seven years so if you are a company which is generating let us say about 100 terabytes of data and you want to put it into s3 and let us say it is about uh, charged about uh, two dollars so if you are putting it into for seven years the amount of cost is going to be very high over a period of time you want to reduce your cost that means that you want to store 100 terabyte for seven years at the lowest cost possible because you are not going to retrieve it every day only your auditor or some compliance request will come so you are going to retrieve the data so at the cost of the retrieval time you can reduce your cost of storage also so when you put something in your glacier you will not be able to retrieve it immediately i you will have to wait about three to six hours in time after three to six hours if you make the request to amazon amazon will make the data available in your target bucket so for the loss of that uh, instant access or uh, immediate retrieval amazon will charge you lesser cost for that so in archival storage you might be charged uh, one dollar price the pricing is a very uh, i'm just giving an arbitrary number if you go to amazon pricing uh, services you will be able to find the exact numbers once again you don't have to memorize the numbers just remember that s3 is for immediate access and it's a costlier service whereas the glacier is an archival service which is uh, at the rate of retrieval time your cost is also coming down and you get the same amount of uh, durability and security that is available in your s3 also and there is no limit on the data that you can store and you can delete it anytime you want and this statement i don't have to repeat it again and again almost all the services in amazon is pay only for what you use there is no static charges saying one time charges or uh, uh, fixed charges in amazon almost all the services there are one or two where you will pay in advance that is voluntarily you go and tell amazon that i will pay let us not confuse that with right now for now remember that almost all the services are pay for what you use so glacier means archival storage these two keywords should, you should literally memorize if uh, an interviewer or somebody or some client asks you what is the glacier storage can i use it the first thing that you need to think of is uh, uh, it's archival storage not immediate retrieval for low cost so if that is the use case your client is asking then propose them glacier otherwise recommend them s3 storage gateway uh, this might be interested for people who are working on on-premise infrastructure uh, what Amazon provides you is a VM. You can download this VM and configure it in your on-premise uh, data center in any of the location. So what you can do with the storage gateway is you can take backup of your data into the cloud. So through this gateway, you can send your data. Let us say your uh, on-premise uh, data center is here and your cloud is uh, here. So you configure your storage gateway and through the gateway the data is sent to your cloud either it can be in s3 it can be in glacier or it can be an ebs volume also so in other words storage gateway allows you to access cloud storage from within your on-premise data center also and it has uh, multiple connectivities available and it directly interfaces with your iSCSI that is a virtual iSCSI interface is available so you can connect it um, the S3 bucket as a disk on your on-premise data center also so it provides you a flexibility of extending your on-premise architecture to the cloud but remember that all this is going to cost you dollars because you are going to push a lot of uh, data through your VPN or your internet service provider to the cloud. So your bandwidth cost is going to come into picture and your storage cost is also going to come into picture. So when you're recommending the storage gateway, you need to calculate cost on both uh, aspects, bandwidth and also storage cost. So keep this in mind when you're recommending this uh, service, but it is very, very flexible to extend your architecture to the cloud. And when you're migrating things, when you're migrating a database or uh, some kind of a VMs, you can use this service to push the data all the way to the cloud very easily using the storage gateway option. 
so that is what storage gateway means let us uh, see uh, next option that is import and export remember the last example i gave you when you're doing migration you want to push data using storage gateway uh, that works great if you have about a few gigabytes of data let us say tens of gigabytes of data but the moment you go to hundreds of gigabytes of data and when you're trying to touch terabytes uh, storage gateway might not be a best option because your uh, throughput will come down your uh, bandwidth cost will go very high uh, instead of that what amazon says is the something called drive shipping i mean drive shipping is the azure word amazon has something called import export disk meaning you literally uh, remove your disk from your data center and give it to, to amazon or send it to post to amazon amazon will upload the data from the disk into any of your s3 buckets in any region that you want and direct connect is another option that is we saw this is a dedicated vpn network that will connect your on premise and cloud so this is for terabyte level that is amazon import export uh, disk option and if you have petabyte of data amazon has something called uh, snowball this is again one to ten petabytes or something like that but if you have more petabytes of data amazon has introduced another service called snowmobile it is a very new service literally they come to your data center with a truck it's a white color truck you can google that and find out it is a snowmobile they come with a data center full of disks <coughs> and they will give you an ice cassie cable you connect it to your on-premise data center and you copy all the data to the disk inside the truck and amazon will drive the truck for you to their data center and copy the data from uh, your disks into your um, s3 bucket so these are the different uh, storage options uh, today it might not be much to you but uh, when somebody asks you how do i move a lot of data from your on-premise to cloud these are the different options to you we will touch upon some of them when you are doing the migration classes uh, especially when you are talking about uh, databases or vms when you're trying to migrate them from on-premise to cloud uh, you will be thinking about uh, all these features kinesis firehose deliberately i'm leaving it because it is uh, Think of a Twitter feed that is coming in, or a lot of processing uh, Facebook feed that you want to store it. So you can literally connect your uh, Facebook uh, to Kinesis. Let us say it is Kinesis and to your S3 bucket. So this kind of a pipeline you can build. So any data that is coming from your Twitter feed and your Facebook feed can be processed by Kinesis and stored in your S3 or EC2 or any other service. So this way, any streaming data can be automatically captured and stored into your account by using the kinesis firehose for streaming data it is great but not for other types of data so i think we have covered storage so the next group of services that we are going to look forward today is databases um, so for databases you have multiple options available in amazon uh, you have from NoSQL to SQL to warehousing, memcaching and all those things. Let us go ahead and see one by one in detail now. So the first and uh, most uh, interesting of services is the RDS relational database servers or the micro, uh, Amazon's uh, SQL as a service uh, in the cloud. So anybody familiar with uh, any SQL databases here uh, should be able to relate to what I'm saying. So when you are running a three-tier architecture or two-tier architecture, data will be usually stored in some kind of a database. Uh, in on-premise world, mostly MS SQL, Microsoft SQL Server, or an Oracle Server will be the most common deployments. But when it comes to cloud, and a lot of people have choices there, and quite common choices is uh, the open source version of uh, SQL that is uh, MS, um, I'm sorry, MySQL and MariaDB is another option that is available. These are different types of database engines that will allow you to store data in a sequential format, row and columns. And Amazon allows you to choose any of those database engines. The licensing is automatically taken care on the background for you. So if you want to choose Oracle and a certain level of CPU, automatically the cost for that instance or database instance includes your licensing cost. So you don't have to break your head on how much cost, I mean, how much licensing I should buy or how should I procure licensing for my databases and how should I manage them. 
the cost for licensing is taken care from completely from your head and also the capacity for your database also you don't have to know it in advance just like an ec2 you can start with the smallest instance and keep growing once you hit the limit you can just stop the database and then increase your database size and then restart it and automatically your database instance will be bumped up to a higher capacity like what that uh, when i say higher capacity we are talking about the cpu and ram likewise you can increase the uh, storage size of your database also uh, because on the background you are getting ebs volumes only for storage in databases so when you're provisioning your ebs volumes remember as i told you you can keep on adding data uh, uh, volumes to the, your uh, database and then it keeps growing automatically and you can take snapshots and you can take uh, encryption also to your databases by default the encryption can happen with your own key or amazon key also that is also possible one of the most imp uh, interesting things about rds is uh, it comes with uh, uh, an option of a high availability configuration all you have to do is uh, choose the drop down box saying deploy in multiple availability zones remember uh, in the when we talk about multiple ACs, i refer to them as high availability so when you deploy rds in multiple ACs, that means that in mumbai if you're deploying an rds with multi az there will be a copy of your database that is a master copy of your database will be available in both your availability zones you will be accessing to only one of them at any point in time but the data will be synchronously copied between both these instances uh, in case one availability zone goes down automatically the traffic will be shifted to the other master instance you don't have to do any configuration any coding change or ip address change or managed failovers on your side the failover from one az master to another az master happens automatically on amazon side itself and since your one master is gone offline amazon will automatically create another master and uh, take care of the replication process also so absolutely uh, a high availability database given to you with a few clicks of a mouse in the cloud and remember that you can run any engine here it is a microsoft sql open source sql oracle sql postgres any of them you can run any of them in your cloud licensing is taken care uh, database upgrades also can be done automatically you just tell amazon saying every sunday at 12 o'clock do my patching and amazon will do that of course there will be downtime so that is why i'm saying you have to choose the time when you want amazon to upgrade it if you don't want uh, amazon to upgrade it don't choose that option so your database will be up and running all the time so uh, it automates a lot of uh, time consuming tasks uh, like uh, patching uh, security configurations and optimizing your databases all these databases are pre-optimized for the best configuration in the cloud if you find still there are parameters that you can optimize you can go ahead and do that using the parameter groups available to you or if you want to change the locale settings say for example you want to have some spanish names uh, which will have accent characters or non ascii characters to be stored on your database then you can change the locale settings from uh, english india to spanish or something like that which allows you to write those acrylic characters in your database so customizations are also possible optimizations are also possible multiple engines are also possible in rds database so that is on the sql variety now we are going to see the no sql variety now amazon's no sql engine is called as a dynamo db when you are saying no sql there is no rows and columns here data is stored in a flat architecture each of them will be stored as collections or json objects or just flat files itself the type of structure is completely chosen to you mostly your application team will decide or an enterprise architect will decide whether you want to use rds that is sql or a dynamo db which is a no sql store in this case the, uh, the choice of high availability is not even given to you if you go ahead and choose dynamo db automatically it will be deployed as an uh, highly available configuration only because it is flat files you can store it and copy it multiple times you there is no synchronous i mean there is no background synchronous replication all those things amazon will take care of the replication a number of times and the scalability is a horizontal here it keeps on growing the, on the size of data you can keep on adding and there is no limit to the data that you need to store in dynamo tv 
and most interestingly to improve the performance of a dynamo db almost uh, all the storage is in ssd disks there is no magnetic disk option or uh, tape drive disk option available in dynamo db whereas those options are available in rds and uh, since we all use memory cards in our phone or we use external hard disk we know that ssd disks are costly so this service is little costlier than your sql database so whenever i say more cost i try to i tend to draw three dollars uh, mentally for me that is more dollars and uh, when i'm talking about uh, rds that is like going to be one dollar it's just a comparison not the one is to three ratio or anything like that amazon says simple and cost effective i don't exactly agree with the cost effective part but it definitely uh, it is uh, one of the most simplest of services uh, because uh, there are just typically two clicks to start a dynamo db collection uh, in your uh, on, in your cloud so it is very very simple to set up and it scales automatically so what else you want you just focus on your database part there is no upgrades there is no patching there is no downtime there is no locales because it's the collection of a file if you want to store numbers if you want to store spanish if you want to store hindi anything you write it in a file and store that file as a collection in dynamodb so it's very very flexible and you are going to spend most of your time configuring your applications rather than maintaining your database so a lot of people use this or a mongodb is an open source option that you can run in amazon ec2 also that is also possible so we saw sql and no sql let us go ahead and see uh, one of the sql on steroids option if rds is equal to sql uh, you whenever somebody says aurora you need to think of sql in steroids what it means is amazon has taken the open source mysql engine and optimized it so that you can run a very big database also as you can see here the biggest database that you can create with aurora is something like 64 terabytes whereas in sql uh, that number is maxes out at uh, uh, lesser, far lesser than this it's i think it is six terabytes uh, you can go ahead and check these numbers once again i don't memorize them but i all i know that is that number is not as high as the 64 terabytes uh, and when i say read replicas what it means is there will be a replica of this database in somewhere else and in rds the amount of read replicas are limited uh, but it goes all the way up to 15 read replicas to improve the performance of aurora so basically amazon has taken sql improved it far better for additional cost and for all these bigger size limits that you get in sql itself uh, some data guys, database guys might be excited to hear about that but most of the admins uh, we just need to know what we are uh, type of database that we are choosing and then set it up for them to consume it moving forward it's uh, elastic cache and memcache i think the next one is uh, elastic cache yeah oh, great so uh, caching services are nothing but uh, to improve the performance of application temporarily certain amount of data will be putting into your cache think of it as the uh, cache that we be familiar with uh, internet explorer or chrome and the same thing concept applies to the applications also if your web page is rendered from multiple elements and the certain elements are common in all the pages then those elements will be stored in your uh, cache database so that the pages can be rest uh, delivered faster to your clients and uh, one of the most common uh, services uh, that provides this uh, I mean, one of the common uh, way to provide this is using elastic cache in the cloud and it uses uh, two types of engines both are open source memcache and redis if any of you are interested in writing a certification for associate architect uh, this question more or less will come what are the uh, types of uh, memcache in elastic cache engine supported by amazon so this is uh, these two are the two things that are available there one is memcache another one is redis uh, there are pros and cons between them you don't have to remember the pros and cons it depends upon the application that you are going to run on the cloud based on that you will choose one over the other and uh, the sizing of the database uh, and the cost of the data i mean the cost of the memcache is going to depend on the sizing of your memcache itself it integrates with your other services like your RDS. <coughs> I'm sorry. 
and CloudWatch for monitoring and for notification SNS also. Uh, some architectures takes uh, advantage of uh, Elastic Cache. Some architectures doesn't need it. If all the pages are going to be created dynamically, uh, very rarely it happens. But in case your architecture requires your page to be refreshed each and every time, and you want to check the session validity each and every time, and want to deliver the page, uh, Memcache will not at all be used. But if there are some elements that you can cache it and render it to your uh, users, then you can recommend uh, your clients to go ahead and use Elastic Cache. So that brings us uh, to the uh, end of database service and foundational service. There is one more very, very important. Uh, we saw the backbone, we saw about the flesh, the connecting network, the pipelines and plumbing is in the networking part. So let us go ahead and see what are the different uh, networking options Amazon provides uh, here. Uh, so this is a broad based one. We already saw this. This is nothing but a VPN connection between your on-premise and your cloud world. So let's go ahead and see each one of them in detail. VPCs, virtual private cloud. That is the full form of VPCs. You literally have to memorize everything and anything that is related to VPCs. Uh, because uh, th uh, there is uh, enough amount of uh, flexibility that it provides and the power it provides uh, and uh, you need to be absolutely familiar with uh, setting up VPCs when you are starting your career in Amazon. The reason for that is it allows you to create your virtual networks inside the cloud network. You can isolate your network from a production dev test or you can isolate ba uh, based on uh, whether customer facing or back ends or front ends or you can isolate them based on your uh, geographical region also, saying my uh, US users will go to this VPC, my Indian users will go to this VPC. So all these kind of flexibilities are possible in VPC. When you say VPC, it is nothing but an IP range at the broadest level. So IP range from one to 10 will be for production, <coughs> 10 to 20 or 11 to 20 will be for dev, uh, 21 to 30 will be for test. You can use any of these ranges within the uh, Amazon uh, provided private IP ranges and the flexibility is given to you and you can have multiple ranges overlapping ranges also. But remember that uh, whenever you have overlapping IP ranges, you cannot have both of them communicate to each other because there will be network collision. So when you are choosing a VPC, always uh, choose sequential ones and easy to understand ones. Just don't choose arbitrarily saying uh, today we will use uh, from 82 to 100. Tomorrow we will do 20 to 30. Then it is very difficult to understand wh what is 82 to 100 and what is 20 to 30. So choose the sequential ones. And uh, if you choose sequential ones, you can definitely pair them with uh, your own VPC or with your clients or with your on-premise data center also without any collisions. So uh, it might be a little uh, overwhelming for people who have not done networking at all. Uh, once we start doing networking in the console and uh, we do the subnets and then the security groups, it will be more and more easier for you to understand what we are talking about here. At this moment, just think of VPC as a, a dashboard for anything related to uh, networking in AWS. More details are coming in later. Today, just need to know that VPC relates to the networking part of Amazon. And load balancing, uh, just as you can see here, it can uh, do HTTP uh, traffic load balancing, it can do HTTPS, it can do EC, uh, TCP IP traffic also, and lately it can do IP based traffic, uh, traffic routing also. So one of the servers might be on your on-prem, the other two servers can be in AWS also. So you can have internet based traffic from your cloud hitting your load balancer and it can route the traffic to any of the instances on the backside. And remember this load balancer is designed for scaling. So it, uh, as and when more and more data requests is coming in, the load balancer will automatically scale up itself. That is the CPU and performance of this load balancer will automatically increase and decrease uh, based on the load that is coming in. You don't have to set up a load balancer, a CPU or memory. You just go ahead and click saying I need a load balancer in this region. Automatically Amazon will force you to choose multiple uh, availability zones so that a high availability of the load balancer itself is maintained. 
and it integrates very nicely with the auto scaling service we spoke about in EC2. That means that whenever new servers are coming in, automatically they will be registered to load balancer so that they can receive and send traffic. And once the auto scaling removes this node, load balancer will get a notification and it will stop sending traffic to that node. So it's a very dynamic service and quite a lot of management of installing, configuring load balancers are uh, taken away from your head. Amazon will manage the high availability and uh, as, it can, as it is broadly written here, dynamically grows and shrinks based on your traffic. So the management part of it is removed from your head. Uh, Route 53, DNS service. Yesterday also we touched upon this marginally. So uh, it, uh, we know what is a DNS service. It can do latency based routing. It can do geography based routing. It can do uh, filtering also. You can use uh, Route 53 to register new domains. Or if you have a domain already in GoDaddy or somewhere else, you can move that uh, management of that domain to Route 53 also. Uh, it's, it's a scalable DNS meaning uh, as and when more, more requests are coming in, the DNS servers will uh, scale to the demand and you, you don't have to worry about managing the DNS server itself. Uh, the service will take care of the scalability part of it. And Amazon has uh, DNS servers all over the world and this is one service where they publicly disclose 100% SLA and they are ready to accept penalty also whenever they are not able to meet 100% SLA. Uh, not important, but uh, good to know because the reason I keep on saying 100% availability is DNS is kind of a gateway to your uh, cloud infrastructure. In case your DNS is not available, there is no point in having a database or a web server or a load balancer running on your on, on cloud because your gateway is down or your entrance to the cloud is down. So that is the reason Amazon provides 100% uh, availability to you guys. So, uh, Direct Connect, it's as I said earlier, it's a VPN connection. You can have multiple options available, multiple internet service providers available. Uh, and this is to connect your on-premise data center to push data to your cloud. And uh, instead of sending it through your internet, it uh, has its own VPN and IP, IP sec, uh, security built into the service. So security is available to you by default when you're using Direct Connect. Once again, since there is additional layer of security and management built into it and the bandwidth is assured for you, you pay a little higher cost for consuming the service instead of using the internet based routing itself. You have multiple options from 50 Mbps to 10 Gbps per port and you can buy uh, any number of port. Let us say you want about 100 Gbps uh, capability. So you go ahead and say, I want 10 Gbps and 10 ports. So you get a bandwidth of 100 Gbps for you. So depending upon your bandwidth requirements, you go ahead and opt for the number of ports that you need with Amazon. And they will provision it working with your data center platform guys and your internet service provider also. Already they have tied up with most of the internet service providers. So they will be ready to work with you but uh, recommend this service only when it is absolutely necessary because it is costly quite a lot of times customers don't want to go for this but as if security is paramount and assured capacity is paramount to your customers then this is one of the good options to look at and there are other services also but since we are talking about amazon cloud so recommend direct connect as the first option in your uh, interviews and if you're talking to clients, I recommend any other cheaper option to your clients. So uh, time is uh, 9.30.